Hi, it's Tom, and I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about a second podcast that I'm starting really soon. Now, I started the American Bandito podcast to meet other artists, but I'm also a musician in a band called Lorenzo's Music. So I wanted to take that same concept from this show and go and meet musicians and people that create music. I'm going to call it the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. I know, brilliant title, right? How long did it take me to come up with that one? So if you're a musician or if you're just interested in music, then keep an eye out for the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. Coming soon. Now here's the show. Previously on American Bandito, I spoke with artist Rachel Dugan, and I discovered that we had a mutual person like that inspired us both. Anything, and I wanted to make things, so then I convinced um, my an illustration professor, Ivan Brunetti, who's a crazy cartoonist. Did I just interject here? <laughs> yeah. The entire reason I'm doing this is because of him. So, a few years back, I went to Texas. This is gonna this this is gonna lead somewhere. I promise you. I went to Texas. My wife was opening one. She had just started working for Sundance Cinemas. They were opening theaters and all, all over the place. I wanted to go to an indie bookstore. I wanted to go to like some neighborhood that wasn't like in the middle of Houston. That's where we were in Houston. The guy that was opening there is like, oh, you got to go to this place. And it was an independent bookstore, a bunch of random like old prints, like Vortex and all that kind of stuff. There was a wrapped thing that was, I want to say it was a comic book quarterly. It was like a, a thick book but it was like a quarterly magazine that was put out and bundled with it was a tiny little book called the art of cartoon and or cartooning and philosophy yes. yes i was like oh those look cool bought it and then we packed it went home and then we ended up moving and it was packed away and then one day i was wanting to get back into doing artwork again or cartooning or make comic books or whatever and i was reading this article and they recommended this book and they showed the cover and I was like, wait, I know that book. So this was like two years later. Wow. And I went and I looked and I found it like in the bottom of one of our boxes and I started going through the lesson plan that he had in there. And the very day he got to the draw a four panel diary of something that happens to you each day was the day that I did my very first cartoon blog. And that was the day that my wife told me that she had cancer. And then... Oh that was when we decided we wanted to do something else with our lives and I was just like I want to get back into art and you know what I'm going to start doing some stuff what can we do and I started this podcast and it was because of that book what? yes that is insane isn't it so the fact that and now I'm talking to you and you're saying you worked with him so let's go back to your story now. Anyway, so there's my backstory. So tell me about this. I, I mean, I'm like speechless right now because that's so random. And yeah. I can honestly say that the only reason that I am an illustrator today and that I draw and am like have connections and am like a confident person, artist, is because of Ivan Brunetti. Now, after I had posted that interview with her, I got a really silly idea in my head. I figured it would never work, but it was worth a try. I sent Ivan Brunetti, the person we were talking about, a link to that episode and just told him I would love to talk with him on the show. I figured what could it hurt? If he didn't respond or said no, at least I tried, right? And to my surprise, he said yes. He is currently at Columbia College in Chicago, just a few hours away. So my wife, Mary Joy, and I took a trip and we went to go meet him. So today on this special episode of American Bandito, I meet Ivan Brunetti. I've, d I've read it several times. One of the things was the in between the panels reference. Just the way going from one panel to another. I always kind of looked at it like you had to see the transition. You had to see how the person got from point A to point B. Some artists uh, slow, slow it down so you see everything, you know. So, I mean, you can certainly do that. You could do that in film, too. I mean, you could uh, film something in real time without editing or cuts, and it's like the scene. Like if somebody walks across the street, you could show that it took 30 seconds for the person to cross the street. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are used to these kind of transitions in film and you could do a quick cut, you know, like someone's at this corner and there's a sign that flashes walk uh, and then they're across the street. You could show it in like 30 seconds if you wanted to. But comics, it's sort of a similar decisions. It depends what you're trying to do in the story. It's sort of like an analog of how somebody might experience something. Like sometimes it feels like time is moving really slowly and you're aware of every little thing. Other times, 
like in a memory, you might jump from one thing to another. One thing that really opened it up was, okay, draw this many panels mm -hmm. and then start shifting them around in the same storyline. And with that first comic that I did, it was actually written in a different order. When I do that with students in class, uh, I take the index cards and I shuffle them around like a magician or, you know, like I move, I move them around and it's just mostly to show them like um, there's more than one way to tell a story or partially about editing. They draw 12 panels and then they pick four that tells, a, usually they pick like the most conventional narrative and then I'll throw things around where there's weird transitions mm -hmm. or, you know, you just get different effects and maybe it changes the story or I, it's just to kind of get people to play around a little bit as opposed to thinking there's just only one way to approach something. So that, that's kind of the point of that exercise. Or when I came up with these exercises, I didn't know what the point was. A lot of times I just improvised things like that in class and then some things worked and some didn't. And then ones that worked better made it into the book. Oh. And then later I could figure out, oh yeah, that works well because it teaches you, you know, A, B, C, and D. But at the time that I thought of a lot of the exercises, I might've had a vague idea like, okay, we're going to do this and uh, this will happen. But mm -hmm. then you actually do it and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you see they're actually better than you thought they were because there's more layers to it that you just intuitively knew, but you could, you know, it took me a while to articulate why it was working. I mean, other times it just didn't work at all, so I just stopped doing them. But it changes all the time. If I, if I were to do another book now, I'd have different exercises and different things. And There's a part in the book where you tell people to pick up random physical objects and try and tie them together. Well, you know, that was a project I did in college that uh, I think I took three art classes. You know, one of them was called Visual Art One. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, there were a lot of people in there. Most of them were not art majors. Uh, I don't even know if we had an art major at the school I went to. Uh, I learned, a, I mean, I still remember that class. He, I mean, I think that's a project that he probably got from when he was in school. Because I've talked to other teachers that tell me like, oh yeah, I had to do that when I was in college. The, mm -hmm. To find a bunch of things and then put them in some kind of arrangement or, or actually order. The words like arrangement and order are very different. Like the, you'll get different results depending on the language you use. The original exercise was to put them in order. And then in my book, I said, you know, or, or I used to say in class, like arrange them. Because you're right. When, when you say order, I see it as they're all in a row. But arrangement means like... Right, which it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it was yeah. sort of like to categorize them. To put things in order means that you thought of how they fit together and in relation to each other. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you say arrange them, you could do anything. Like you could just uh, put them on a table and try to take up as much space or as little space. I liked seeing the uh, like what other people did with it. I remember struggling with that in school like because there, there was every project we did in that art class there was no solution <laughs> so that uh it was, i went to university of chicago like everybody is you know hyper whatever intellectual and you, everyone believed there was an intellectual solution to everything and mm -hmm. so the art class was great because it basically said there isn't a solution to any of the problems that he posed to us and he even said that like like toward the end of the class like i don't know if you've noticed but every assignment I give you has no solution, which was a, I think for people used to thinking that they could intellectually solve a problem as if everything were like a math problem. It made you rethink things like, oh, I guess I can't find an answer. Like art doesn't work that way. It's not like an accounting problem. You have to pose your own questions, make your own answers. Sometimes there is no real answer. So that project stuck with me amongst many that we did in that class. I think for cartooning, it could be an exercise in, again, seeing different narratives with the same elements. You're actually creating a story. Even the objects you chose probably tell a story about yourself of why you chose them. It could be as simple as like, those were things that were in my backpack, or it might be more complex. Like, what were you looking for in your house? There's probably like a, a story somewhere in there. And then the other part of it was editing them. So putting them in order or rearranging them or taking some out that don't fit as well forces you to edit, which means you're trying to see the narrative that's latent in there. Different things, maybe they didn't even realize that they, when they chose those objects, they were creating a story. I've read that section of the book and I'm always like, oh, I could go, I have to think of things I want to go find this time around. And you were like, these things were in my backpack. And I'm like, oh my God, I could have just grabbed what was well, next to me. Have, you could have, <laughs> but then those would be interesting too. Because what's, what's in your backpack or what did you consider? Yeah. 
<laughs> so when I was, uh, whatever, 19 years old, the one that stuck out to me, because in my mind, I'm so literal and concrete. Like, I just was so worried about choosing the right things. But there was somebody who, um, there were a lot of interesting ones, but one that stuck out to me was someone chose objects that all had a twist or a turn in them. And it took a while to see, like you had to see a number of them to get the idea. And then there was, I remember there was a, a plot, like a book amongst the objects, which are things like springs or coils or anything that had kind of like a twist in it. And that, and that was sort of like this intellectual idea, like that the plot had a twist in the book. Oh. You had to kind of think about that one. But when you see enough of the other ones, then your brain makes that leap. Like, well, what could possibly, what could this book have in common with all these things that look like they have spirals or whatever? There was a point where I wasn't drawing as much, so I just wanted to stay busy. So I started making things that were more three-dimensional. And they kind of connected to the way I draw because they're kind of simplified and based on simple kind of abstract geometric ideas and shapes. So they were, you know, it was partial. It was maybe the same process of kind of uh, trying to pare everything down to like the, the the most basic shape or something like that. How did you, I guess, evolve into that? Uh, that's like a question for a psychiatrist because <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think everyone uh, they. As you make stuff, it's going to change, and you're not always aware of the changes. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's like having less and less time to do stuff. I tried to find ways to simplify certain things or get closer to my to the way that I doodle. And I was doing that for a while. I was kind of trying to embrace a really spontaneous kind of line and style, but it was hard to maintain uh, consistency with that. It's very hit or miss for me uh, to be like something like a spontaneous mark. It's hard to repeat it and be consistent. So then I started um, using more drafting tools to kind of make it more consistent. And then when I would really go through periods of severe depression, it was just hard to pick up a pencil. And some of those drafting tools like rulers and templates it was just a way to get something on the page. So I would just start making shapes. Like I started drawing like that with those tools because it was also a way to step outside myself, I think. I was doing more personal stories and it was difficult for me uh, to quote unquote go there, you know, but if, if you're working more abstractly, you can kind of distance yourself from the content of what you're drawing. So I think it started to move in that direction yeah. to the point now where um, I've reached an absurd level of um, having very little of my hand in there. It's all these... Um, there's very little kind of spontaneous drawing. Hmm. So I think I'm slowly moving back the other way now because I hit a wall. So I think that that's kind of been my whole life. I'll do something till I hit a wall and then I kind of start, I don't know, stumbling sideways and go in another direction for a while. But it's not planned. I don't know. Sometimes I think I could just scrap everything and start over and just draw in a whole different way. Or like draw more naturalistically. Mm -hmm. it could just be. Um, I don't think I'd be that good at it. Um, also, my um, my eyes are just getting worse and worse every year, and I just can't see as well. So, part of drawing these more abstract shapes was a way to. Um, it's almost like drawing with your mind more than your hand. Mm -hmm. I could almost have someone else draw it for me by verbal description. You know, draw a circle. Go halfway down the circle and draw a smaller circle. I mean, it. it it started to become like a, an abstract set of rules that you could almost program a computer or something to do. Or, and I think that was partially like thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go blind at the rate I'm going. So how am I going to draw from just muscle memory? And so some of those drawings that are so geometric and simplified, you could almost do that. Even if your eyes were really, really bad, you could kind of make a drawing like that. And maybe that was part of it, too. I drew a couple of kids' books. Actually, I was going to give you one. Oh. Where is it? It just came out. This, uh, oh, I uh, saw these. Yeah. yeah. So um, noticed in there, though, I like uh, I like finding references, and I like sketching uh, from references. But then I'm kind of simplifying them again and abstracting them. But I do like the process of, like, going online and having to look up what a car looks like or... <laughs> Right. I hate drawing cars. Even as a kid, I oh hated God, cars. I but oh, even like in that book, I had to draw instruments, so I had to look up what you know, 
you know, clarinet's hard to do from memory. <laughs> so I, I'd have, I, I'd like, but I like drawing from a reference photo, but I would sketch, I would sketch from those and then I would absorb what the object looked like and then put that away and then go to my drawing table and draw from memory, mm -hmm. which would still be wrong, but closer to what the thing might look like. So I'd still have to simplify it in my style, but I had a better understanding of what I was drawing. And I think um, that's what kids are trying to do. They're not, you know, they're not thinking like, I'm going to really distort this space and use this weird non-perspective. I think they're just, they're trying to get their memory or understanding of what something is like. And I think they're trying to get maximum information into the drawing, which means that maybe you're not using perspective because, you know, you need to see all four walls or something. So for me, it was sort of uh, just letting uh, some kind of intuitive process of what do I need, what do I need to show, like we're in a room or we're in this location of what the figures might look like in there. And it ends up being kind of this flat and distorted thing, but that's not even like what I'm thinking of when I do it. I really am trying to tap into like the way kids might do it. When I was growing up, I kept trying to draw everything realistically and it ended up looking like a cartoon version of somebody trying to draw realistically or it would look like the Scooby-Doo movie characters. It's like there was still something inherently like that looks like an animated character. Absorb all that, yeah. right? Because we're watching those things and you pick up a certain shorthand from comic books and animation. A lot of what I do is it's just from absorbing uh, Disney comics when I was really little and then uh, Peanuts. So it's like my version of smashing those two things together and then it, you get something like what I do, I guess. Oh, not as good. I don't, I don't mean to compare myself <laughs> to Charles Schultz, but definitely it's, it's so absorbed I don't even notice I'm doing it. Like just even the idea that I want to draw a circular head, even though Charles Schultz never really drew perfect circular heads it's ingrained you know like i that's my shorthand that makes sense to me i read that circle as a, a human head mm -hmm. and it, i don't even question it but that's just from absorbing so many of these uh, comics and cartoons you draw a picture of a rectangle and then you put a circle on the right of it and all of a sudden it's a door you know it's just recognizable yeah that's true <laughs> right <laughs> okay. yeah. but but that's what i get from with you saying like you draw a circle and that's just that's a head like we all absorb some kind of visual shorthand get these projects did you just decide to do the book did somebody hire you to do the book I did one before this which i guess i'll it's a boring story i'll try to make it interesting <laughs> so uh i've done some magazine covers um so like the new yorker magazine for instance it's unusual in that the artists they submit the ideas maybe once in a while there's a there's like a current event that bears representing on the cover so you might get an email we were looking for an image about whatever the event was mm -hmm. i'm never good at those i can't come up with something really usually they're on a really tight deadline and i'm just not clever enough or quick enough with the drawing to come up with anything good so what i do is if when i think of ideas if i think i have a decent one i'll submit the idea to the editor i think there was a point where i was drawing like kids back to school because i know they often do a back to school issue cover and not the issue the covers don't really have anything to do with the inside hmm. which is also unusual for a magazine sure. especially today so they really let the artists kind of come up with the ideas and suggest the ideas and then it goes through an editorial process and if an idea is approved it might get refined and i had this stretch of like drawing kids in a playground and a classroom and uh, the ideas just weren't gelling so they kept getting rejected and i tried to change them and I knew I wanted to draw these kids because I got obsessed with that. And the editor uh, of the New Yorker magazine covers also does this Toon Books project, Francoise Mouly. This is a sort of like a side project she has of editing and publishing these Toon Books. Just threw it out there like, hey, you know, why don't you try to do a, like submit an idea for a Toon Book? And then I thought, like, well, I don't know how to do that at all. And then she's just thought, like, sure you could. You know, here's some topics. <laughs> so we talked about it. There were some topics that were pretty open-ended, you know, like one. And I saw one of them was compound words. And for some reason, I thought, well, maybe I'll do something like with words because I like playing with words. So mm -hmm. then it turned into word play was the name of the book. And then I just kind of came up with a, a rough storyline, which I do in the thumbnail form. It's kind of like every project I do. I kind of have to see the whole thing. So I do a very, very kind of quick doodle style 
to get a sense of how many pages. And these books had like kind of a standard format, so I knew I had to tell the story in a certain number of pages. Mm -hmm. And then it's a back and forth with the editor, and she had a lot of suggestions, and then I changed the the thumbnail, and I don't know, took a few back and forth kind of things, and then eventually we kind of got it to, you know, a 32-page book that made sense, and the story had a certain flow. And you also have, there's so many factors when you communicate uh, to children. This, I think they're aimed at, like, kids that are, like, five years old, so you can't do, like, weird kind of you know, cuts or something, right? Mm -hmm. They kind of, they need to see like, wait, how do we get from here to there? You have to give them enough so they can understand what they're reading because they're also having to parse words and pictures and then the language of comics. So I learned a lot doing it. Like it really forces you to be very clear. But at the same time, I wanted it to be funny and all that and um, hopefully get kids to appreciate the playful aspects of language maybe. And then it just worked out that people seemed to enjoy it. So I think a few months after the book was actually printed, the idea came like, oh, maybe I should do a companion book about n numbers. I, I saw numbers and counting was another one of like the topics from the uh, first list that I had. And I also um, had the benefit of creating kind of a cast of characters in the first book. So I wanted to do a book to feature all the kids a little bit more. Really often it's you, the artist, would have an idea, you submit it to someone that you think would be interested in the idea. I like collaborating with uh, Francoise because she's a really good editor and mm -hmm. all her ideas are always good and I learn a lot from doing it, so I enjoy the kind of back and forth conversations we have and then she'll kind of go in and move things around a little bit. We'll make like little PDFs with uh, suggested changes and it's all like really i mean i wish i had an example like i just doodle kind of like this you know right and it's stuff like this but somehow i think we've worked together long enough that she can like understand my doodles well, and translate her, them anyway. uh well her uh, husband art spiegelman is a cartoonist and when i started cartooning comics was a very small world like that everyone seemed like people just knew each other because you would go to a comic convention or something. And I remember when I started drawing comics, I could probably name every cartoonist because there weren't that many people doing it. Um, I think it was uh, at a comic show and um, it was the SPX show in Bethesda, Maryland. I think Art Spiegelman was there and Francoise, uh, who also was, they, they had edited an anthology in the 1980s and early 90s called Raw. They just happened to be at that show and I don't know, I got invited to like a big group dinner with like my publisher at the time, Fanographics. But anyway, I ended up talking to her then. So that was in 1997 and then a about two, three years later, I sent her some cartoon drawings. I didn't realize that she doesn't edit the cartoons. I had no idea, like, how the work's divided at The New Yorker. There's somebody else that edits the cartoons. Let's say that was around the year 2000. And then in 2006, I got uh, somehow on a magic email list asking for ideas. So I think it was uh, just critical mass. I think at the, around that time, I'd, I'd done enough work where maybe it had gotten better, you know, over the years. And so somehow I got on the radar of, because I knew her for a long time and we had a friendly conversation, but it took me years to even send something to her. And then it was the wrong kind of thing. And then it was many years after that. But, you know, in between that time, I had done a lot more comics where I think there might've been a jump in my own uh, or a little bit of an advancement in my own ability. That when I think back to 1997, I don't think my work was very good. But by, you know, 2007, it was a little better. So I guess I had a better chance. <laughs> I'd improved. Yeah, you did 10 uh, years in there. There you? was 10 years to improve. And uh, I always uh, liked the magazine. And I had a book of, like, the covers from, I don't know what it was, 1925 to 1989. So as part of it was, like, studying it, too, like, trying to get there. You're talking about the New Yorker ones. For a brief second, I'm like, wait, Raw Magazine went all the way back to 1925? No, no, that's, yeah, this is the time about the New Yorker. But right. Raw, but I knew Francoise from, I knew of her from right. um, Raw Magazine. So, it's like, it's kind of a dream come true to work with her because I wouldn't even be a cartoonist if it weren't for Raw. Because uh, I discovered that in college at the same time as Mouse. Those were the two big things that made me really get back into comics because I'd kind of given up drawing. And my idea of comics before then was maybe, uh, you know, like what's in the daily newspapers or right. 
uh, superhero comics. So just seeing this whole other world of what you could do with comics that kind of opened my brain up. So really I owe her quite a bit. So it's a nice feeling to be able to work with her and talk to her and collaborate on the ideas. Who'd have known? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, really, you know, if you'd asked me like in 1986 if this was going to happen, I probably would have said no. Never. You just have to keep plugging away at it, I guess. If you had already said that you were kind of given up on it. I gave up drawing because my family was never very supportive. They were actually very unsupportive of that. Even before I finished elementary school, I, I stopped drawing pretty much. And then in high school, I might have drawn like a couple of pictures. Hmm. And then in college, I started doing um, cartoons after about, I don't know, like the first year of college. Around that time, also... I was looking at Matt Groening's Life in Hell comic, mm -hmm. so that was an, also an inspiration. So I thought maybe I should, you know, and I was I started doodling things and just to make people laugh. I guess I was able to make some people laugh, so that gave me the confidence to try to bring them to the student paper. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what I was doing um, other than like I could doodle something that would make somebody laugh. And it took a long time. I, I mean, I'm describing all this, but this is like decades of trying to get better and trying to teach myself how to draw again and just kind of studying the history of comics, under trying to understand the language of how they work. I would just tell anyone that that's really all there is to it. You just have to keep doing it until you basically start to understand it from doing it. Yeah. And then you start, you know, you start to have insights just from the daily practice of doing something. If you're lucky, you find a mentor here and there that, and you get a little bump, a little push. Are you to sustain yourself making comics? I mean, just out of curiosity? Yeah, people can do. I think I just, uh, I'm from a generation where that wasn't even a thought. And um, when I started drawing comics, I liked that they were under the radar and nobody really cared. I mean, adults go to see superhero comic movies. You know, that was unheard of when I was growing up. It really was like a an isolated subculture, and that's not true at all anymore. But you're also free to kind of, especially in the world of zines and kind of independently produced uh, mini comics, as we called them, which were just Xeroxed comics. Mm -hmm. And it, it just seemed like a few people that were mailing them to each other, and it was before the internet and all that stuff. So it seemed like a small world, like in the, in the midnight less fear about just trying to do something, whereas I think now the pressure would be on. I don't wish they found a way to sell enough copies to make a living, but I, I never really thought I'd be able to do that. So my idea was, and this might have been a really stupid idea now that I'm 50 years old, <laughs> and I wish I could relive my life, but I thought in my early 20s that I really developed this love of comics toward the end of college. I had a friend who died unexpectedly, you know, he had like a brain aneurysm. I thought, like, my God, you could just go at any moment. Mm -hmm. What am I doing with myself? So kind of right at the end of college, I decided that I did want to draw, but I knew that I'd have to learn how to do it, and it would take me a long time. So I just figured I'll just have a job, and I'll draw in the evenings and weekends, and that was my idea, and that's kind of been my life since then. If I'd had a whole different life prior to that, with maybe some encouragement along the way or some kind of positive reinforcement from somebody, <laughs> you know, I might have been uh, a different, I mean, I would have been a whole different person that might have taken a risk and taken a chance. And that just wasn't even in the, like in the realm of possibility. So for me, it's just been this thing I do kind of outside of how I make a living. Um, for some people, like they put themselves in that situation and it's like, it's either sink or swim and then they can do it. But I don't deal well with sink or swim. It's, for me, it's like sink. <laughs> sink or swim, <laughs> it's going to be sink. You know, but, uh, you know, that's I have had to acknowledge that about my own temperament. Because of the success of some cartoonists, especially in the last 15 years, 20 years, it seems very much like in the, a doable thing, like that you could get a book deal and do comics and make a living. Whereas for, I guess I just missed that whole boat. The one good thing about that this is not how I make my living, I can be picky. I'm not looking for stuff. I'm not sending out my work to everybody. So if somebody like once every five years comes along and asks me to draw a poster or an album cover or whatever, a t-shirt or whatever... That's more manageable for me, so I can do that project. And it's not even about the money. Well, what about the, the exhibition you did in Las Vegas? That was for the money. <laughs> <laughs>
There was somebody who worked for the city who was a fan of my comics, and he really encouraged me to pursue that. I didn't think I would have a shot in hell to do that, but he really encouraged me, and he might have even been on the, the board of people that decided. So that just was a, an anomaly. Like That was a one in, like the one and only time I would do like something like that. And that really depended on there was somebody who was really intent on like having me do this because I would have given up on it like a million times through that whole process. Mm-hmm. But it, it, somehow uh, I did it and it ended up being lucrative. So, um, you know, helped me pay off like all my credit cards. And <laughs> so wow. thank, thank God that at the time that there was somebody that really wanted me to do that because I don't think I would have pushed myself. I just didn't even think I had a chance. I'm like, why am I doing this? I don't want to waste my time on something that's not going to happen. But then it did happen. So He had no question, it sounded like to me. I think sometimes like I'm, I can be swayed by somebody that has a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the end, I just came up with a way to do what I always do, which is just turn it into a comic, which wasn't necessarily the project. It was just supposed to be like 50 banners. But then... I just turned it into like, okay, I guess it's like drawing a 50 panel comic strip. Yeah. And so, and I thought up, that was brilliant. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, and it was an unusual opportunity, but I ended up just using the skills I had basically. I'm doing another book for Toon Books, but it's more like a manual of, uh, it's actually kind of like the cartooning book, but it's for kids. Oh. So, I mean, really little kids, like five to eight or something. And it's about, like, understanding comics, how they work, the nuances of them, using them in the classroom. And when I'm done with all that, which should be around next summer, I'll probably work on an autobiographical comic that I've been putting off for, like, uh, 20 years now. I have a million pages of notes. Um, I think I'm just it's just time to draw it now. It's not going to be a million pages. <laughs> I always think things are going to be like a thousand pages long and then they end up being like two pages long. (laughs) So I think that'll happen with this project. Uh, Part of it is that the more I think of it as some big project that makes it worse for me. If it's like a magnum opus, like that just paralyzes me. So Hmm. I think if I can just turn it into something modest, I would have more like feel more inspired to actually do it. But that'll that'll probably take up most of my time. I just haven't learned how to manage my time very well. It's like I tend to do one thing to the exclusion of everything else. It's also hard for me, like I'm at my job all day, and as I get older, it's hard to switch gears when I get home. Mm. Okay, I'm going to do this other thing. When I was younger, I could do that, and I could stay up really late and draw, and then switch gears again to, for the next day. But I'm trying to find ways to be able to work on multiple things at once like a little bit at a time I mean, just out of curiosity is this something where you get paid after you make it or is there a okay here's you're going to make this here's how much we're going to give you basically like for a book you would get a certain amount which most publishers what they would like is that you they never have to pay you royalties so they'll give you a certain amount of money like if all your books sold here's how much you would have gotten in the end so you get it as an advance if you sell out the book then you start to get royalties like if it goes into a second or third printing and then they have to keep paying you so for accounting purposes they will give you an advance where it's like you know they wouldn't have to give you royalties but sometimes there's books that become very successful unexpectedly and then the publisher has to keep sending you that check every year usually you get like half as an advance and then half when you're finished or sometimes you get a third as an advance of your royalties, and then a third when you hand in the book, and then a third when it's actually published, because there's usually like about a year. It takes a while, even like after you hand a book in, to actually go through the production. And Mm -hmm. so they either divide it in half or in thirds. And then you would keep getting paid if your book's an unexpected success and it sells a lot more copies than was ever anticipated, then you would just keep getting paid Hmm. a royalty. For most illustration projects, they, they will pay you when you're finished. And those would be on a much faster time frame because something would be needed in a week or a, or a month or what have you. I do like the fact that the payment method for the book is kind of like the same thing in a mafia movie. We'll give you half up front and half after you've done the job. Yeah, so you're just giving people enough that they can keep working on it, uh, but you also have to take some away. Like, you got to finish it to get the other <laughs> yes, part of exactly. it. I'm sorry, but that was a huge deal for me. 
When I started doing this back in May of 2017, I just wanted to start something new in my life and feel more connected to creative people. And it all began with the ideas that filled my head reading Ivan's book, Cartooning, Philosophy, and Practice. These ideas turned into drawing more, wanting to learn lessons from other people, turned into this podcast. And I never would have expected that I would get a chance to talk to the person that wrote that book. So I'm happy for that random trip to a bookstore several years ago during a visit to Houston. I just wanted to let you know that this is the last episode for this season of American Bandito, but I am currently working on recording the next season, which should be out in the next few months. Now, the best way to hear about when the next season starts, subscribe to the email list at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, or like the American Bandito page on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Bandito. And the music for this show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. And you can download our new release, Rom-Com Mixtape, at lorenzosmusic.com. And I wanted to add, if you create things and would like to be on the next season of this show, you can send an email to tom at americanbandito.com. I really appreciate you listening, and I hope to see you in the next season of this show. So until then, so long. So long.